Welcome to the CX Impact Podcast. Speed up your customer experience success. The CX Impact Podcast is brought to you by Gemseek, your trusted analytics advisor, helping you predict what your customers will do next. We invited today Michael Brandt to join us on our CX podcast. Michael has over 30 years of experience in B2B and has recently started his own CX company. He was on various senior management roles, including general manager manufacturing, general manager quality, and uh, group B2B customer experience. Now in his newly established consulting company, he provides consulting around CX strategy, customer experience, customer journey mapping, and customer feedback management, among others. Thanks for agreeing to participate, Michael. Nice to have you. Thanks for the invitation, Monson. How all started and how you will uh, end up being vice president customer experience? Okay. Well, I always enjoyed working with people. I mean, you know, this was something that uh, that I noticed very early on. I started off my career in the airline industry in passenger services, and you know, when when people travel, they're generally stressed, and it reflects on their behaviour. So it was an interesting job in that you always had to adapt from one kind of passenger to the other very quickly, adapt to their moods and their uh, and their stress. So I was I was in the airline business for a couple of years, and then I went to work for ABB. Initially, it was in technology transfer, so licensing. Uh, it sounds quite dry, but actually it was uh, also important to try and figure out what the licensee was looking for and the technology transfer agreement and finding a way to give that to them in agreement, with, which was a win-win for both companies. At the time, I was dealing mainly with companies in China, Korea, and Japan, uh, and I really enjoyed getting to know these uh, uh, Far Eastern cultures, and, and they're all very different, so it was also a, an is- interesting challenge. My first real experience in customer service on a, in a B2B level was when I was in Japan from 2000 to 2007. Customer service in Japan is really, it's... It's in their cultural DNA, and and my wife and I were just blown away by the customer focus of companies in in Japan. And so when I moved back to Switzerland in 2007 to a position as quality manager within the business unit that I was working for at the time, customer feedback was one of the things that was high on my list of priorities. And I was doing this customer feedback program at at BU level uh, at ABB until 2012, when I was asked to move to ABB's headquarters to look after ABB's NPS program uh, globally across the group. And and that was a real challenge uh, and, and extremely interesting because up till then, ABB really hadn't been doing anything in a coordinated way. The divisions and the business units had been doing separate things. But it was really interesting to do this on a global basis with such a such a huge company. The NPS program had been set up the previous year, but there was it was set up by somebody who was in marketing communications, and, and it looked very good. And and it was um, uh, from a marketing and a communications point of view, it was it was fantastic. It was easy to use and looked very good. But the important thing then was to add uh, some substance to it in the back with the follow-up, the the processes for handling this follow-up and for working on resolving the negative customer feedback uh, in a sustainable way. And with the quality background that I had at the time, uh, that was a perfect match. Uh, So then, so that was 2012. And in 2013, uh, I also took on responsibility for complaint management within ABB. And, And so this actually really allowed us to put customer feedback, complaint management all in one pot and uh, allowed us to develop some good processes to deal with the uh, customer feedback and, and feedback management across the ABB group. And I, and I was with ABB until the end of 2019 uh, when I left and uh, set up on my own, as you uh, rightly just uh, just said. What an exciting journey. It's uh, very interesting to hear when we're having different guests that most of them have started their career in, um, for example, retail, hospitality, or um, airlines, uh, someone that they were very close by uh, the end customer. And no matter what they did afterwards, they eventually ended up again on similar role. People who do that, I think it's because when they start up, when they leave school, you know, you always try to look for a job that you'll enjoy. And I think people who enjoy working with other people, they gravitate towards these kind of positions. And throughout your career, you might end up moving away and gaining experience somewhere else. And I did that. I mean, you know, 
doing technology transfer wasn't necessarily something I ended up dealing with with a lot of people regularly. It's it, it is fairly dry, you know. You're, you're dealing with contracts and things like that, and quality management. Also, you're dealing with a lot of statistics and things like that. But it allowed me to gain a, a lot of experience and also to come to learn some of the tools that I would use later in a CX perspective to try and resolve issues. So, so it was, uh, yeah, it's been an interesting and very enjoyable path, I would say. You mentioned uh, Japan, as we've been doing also Waterfork in Japan, um, at GenSeq, and we always struggle a lot with uh, even taking the basics when it comes to all the different, like the official languages and that you should be formal to different people using yes. a different vocabulary. I was wondering how you managed to deal with this complexity. Great thing when you're in when you're working in Japan as a foreigner is that I have to say the Japanese are very tolerant, okay. and and they you know if you're a foreigner there they understand that you're going to make mistakes, and they're very tolerant of uh, foreigners. But I think it also allowed me also to do quite a lot. For instance, in, in a Japanese company, and we were a joint venture between ABB and, and a Japanese conservative a Japanese company. When there's an issue the uh, generally the people say okay we don't get the top guy involved until the issue's been resolved and and very often this can mean that it takes quite a long time to actually actually resolve an issue uh, and i would tell my people look if we have a problem let's not let it get uh, out of hand let's not allow it to grow involve me at a very early stage and and sometimes uh, they would say oh you know we have this big problem but we, you know, we don't want you to to get involved because, you know, if you go to visit the customer and he's very angry, you know, you, you'll lose face. And, uh, you know, my point was that as a foreigner, I didn't really have that much face anyway. And very often we'd go visit these customers and just by virtue of the fact that I was the top guy in the company visiting the customer, this would show them how important they were to us. And very often, you know, meeting with their top guy too, we were able to find solutions very quickly and resolve the issues. And, and I did that a few times when we had, had big issues and it worked out absolutely fine. So sometimes you can use this, uh, this freedom to, uh, to actually resolve issues much quicker than they might otherwise be resolved if you stuck to the local cultural ways of doing things. Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. Going to your journey at ABB, you started uh, being responsible for the MPS program at the beginning, which even it was not very clearly said that you ended the complaint management. Can you tell us a bit more about this journey? What were the challenges? What were the big successes that you were really proud with? The big advantage that we had in ABB when we started off the, the NPS program was that the decision to start it was actually made by the CEO at the time, Joe Hogan, who, who'd come from GE Healthcare and had already used NPS. Uh, and he made it very clear, you know, that he wanted ABB to do NPS. And it was a very, very clear message from the top. And sometimes we would have a little bit of passive resistance. Some people who said, look, I don't really see why we need to do this. And, and the message, you know, was very clear from the top. You'll do it. We're going to do this. And I, I still remember one, one thing that Joe Hogan said during one of his videos internally. He said, we have to be prepared to listen to uncomfortable truths. We have to figure out, we have to be prepared now for our customers to tell us that there are things they don't like about this. And so this a very, very strong backing from, from the CEO and made it a lot easier than it might otherwise have been. But then the, uh, the really important thing was to get this rolled out in over 50 countries worldwide. Uh, so we were, it was a question of language. Uh, it was also a question of ensuring that when we got feedback, uh, that there were processes in place to follow up on the feedback, to resolve the issues. And we had several things in our company uh, scorecard. For instance, uh, follow up of detractor feedback was um, our KPI was 100%. That was in the scorecard, and we managed to uh, do that three years in a row. And it was something that we tracked. And it was amazing to see the effect that it had on our customers. A lot of our customers said that they really, really appreciated the fact that we were listening to them and that we were going back to them and we were updating them on what measures were being taken to, to handle the issues that they'd mentioned. 
And gradually, as people within the company began to see the impact that this was having, and that the feedback we were getting was actually very valuable, and that a lot of things we could actually work on and correct, then it became really a part of ABB's DNA. And when Joe Hogan left a couple of years later, there was no question at all about whether uh, NPS was going to be continued. It had already become part of ABB's DNA, and nobody was talking about getting rid of it or changing to a different system at that time. So it was a really big step forward, and I think it made a a big difference to the way that uh, people within ABB consider the customer. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, very powerful, and the fact that you managed to make part of the DNA is really super important. Within overall the B2B space, I in B2C as well, but what we're seeing in B2B that companies might be struggling with making the first steps and uh, really identifying the must-win battles. How will you did this piece? So what are the challenges facing companies that want to start off? Uh, yeah, uh, at the beginning, uh, how you decided exactly uh, which actions to take? Because there's so many things that you have to do on your list. Sure. Uh, and I, I think, how to prioritize them, it will be very helpful for I understand. I, I think the really, really important thing, without any doubt, is that it, it's really important for the customers to feel that they're not wasting their time. Right, and that somebody is reading the feedback that they get on a survey. And it doesn't matter what you use, whether you use NPS, CSAT, customer effort score, if you're if you're giving customers the opportunity to give you feedback and they and they give you verbatim comments and tell you why they're giving you a specific uh, score or comment, it, it's really important to follow up and, and to make sure that the customer understands that, that the feedback is being taken very seriously. When we first started our, our surveys, it was actually quite funny. Some people would, would respond to, uh, to the survey by email, so not actually fill out the survey, but just respond to the email that, that carried the survey. And, and sometimes they weren't necessarily very polite. Uh, <laughs> they said, no, why, you know, why, this is a waste of time. Nobody reads this stuff anyway. And I, I made a point of replying to every one of these emails. And it was amazing then that people would reply to me and say, wow, I didn't know that anybody actually read this, <laughs> you know, and, and, and yes, but sorry, I'm, you know, absolutely, I'll do the survey, you know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I apologize. And, and it was very good. And I think that's really important. If customers feel that they're being listened to and that somebody's doing something about what they say, that, then it encourages them, encourages them to give more feedback, uh, to be more open, to give you better insights. Uh, and obviously, it increases your, uh, your response ratio also. So, so I think that really is the first thing, you know, is, is to have a concept in place, have a process in place, say, okay, customers are going to answer. What are we going to do with the answers? This is really important. And, and I think the second thing is, is um, don't ask too many questions right? Uh, You know, sometimes you get these surveys which are 70 questions long, or you get a survey that has a progress bar in the top of the window. This is ridiculous, right? Just concentrate on what you need to know. At ABB, we we said, okay, what's top of mind, right? So we gave the customer the possibility to give two negative comments maximum or two positive comments maximum, Mm -hmm. because we really wanted them to focus on what was top of mind, what was really important for them. And that also meant that with the data that we were getting back, it was manageable, right? You know, we weren't suffering from data paralysis. We We weren't getting so much data that we weren't able to cope with it. But what we were getting was the data that was really important the data that our customers were really, the things that our customers were really unhappy about. But on the other hand, we were also being told what our customers were happy about so that we could reinforce those actions and try and spread them throughout the organization as best practices. Absolutely, it's, uh, that's super important. And how you managed to roll out 50 markets? Um, have you used any system or standardization? What we're seeing a lot that customer experience varies from one country to another, even from one touch point sure. uh, to another. So really delivering um, consistent experience is what most of the companies are struggling with. Have you faced uh, such uh, issue as well? 
Of course. I mean, you know, you, you can't act the same in, let's say, Germany as you would in Japan. I mean, there are, there are big cultural differences. So we, we always worked, we had a, a local team that we worked with. So the, the, the main campaign was, uh, was run from head office. But in each country, we had a team of people who, who would look at the uh, cultural differences or different local differences that needed to be made. But we tried to keep these differences to a minimum so that there was at least a company standard, uh, and that was important. But we also made sure that we didn't any, offend anyone locally or, or do anything stupid locally, uh, thanks to these local teams. So yeah. it was really a good cooperation, you know, from, from head office down to the various country organizations. And um, have you used any technology to implement the entire program? Uh, we used, we, it was, uh, ABB has a, a, a very big... Um, IS development uh, center in, mm-hmm. in Krakow in Poland and so this was this was all developed in house and integrated into our own global applications such as our complaint management tool mm-hmm. it also was integrated into our uh, salesforce application called salesforce.com uh, so so that we were able to really spread this information uh, customer information throughout the whole organization Sounds great, and uh, like most local companies don't have the resources, of course, to uh, oh, of course, build right. such a solution yeah. internally. But when you yeah. can do it uh, so customized that it can absolutely fit all your processes, that's the best option, of course. Yeah, yeah, sure. But yeah, as you said, it's not cheap, and it's 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 not for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that also mentioned it's super interesting, um, and most of the companies I think fail to do is really to coming back. To customers with the measures taken, I was. If you can share even some stories around what was the impact of this? Yeah, sure. So I, I mean, this was this. There was a really, really big potential there for for service recovery, and uh, I, I remember it was a company in the UK that I had called every so often. You know, I would go to the countries and and make presentations to the local country management team. And when I did that, before I went, I would uh, pick some uh, detractors from our NPS survey at random, and I would call them up and say, you know, six months ago, you did the survey, you were a detractor, let me know, you know, how was the follow-up? Uh, and I remember talking to, to, to one, uh, one company, and he said, you know, when we got the survey, we were in a very, very bad place with ABB. Uh, in fact, when I got the survey, I gave it to my managing director to fill out, and we were absolutely scathing uh, about the service that we we were receiving at the time. But then he said, okay, after the survey, there two of your people came to do the follow-up to discuss. And he said the effort that they put into finding a solution to this problem was absolutely fantastic. And he said, I can tell you now that we are far happier with ABB now than we have ever been before, just by virtue of the effort that you put into resolving these issues after on the basis of our, our survey. And, and, and so these kind of things were popping up all over the place. And it really shows that uh, the customers that you care about what they say. And on our hand, on, on the inside, you know, a lot of our staff were seeing that by, by responding and really trying to resolve these customer issues, they were they were making a lot of headway in their relationship with customers. Also, we found, for instance, that uh, if uh, if um, I had a story, for instance, of a sales guy who had been trying to get in to see somebody at, at one of the uh, his customers, but this this customer kept putting him off, putting him off, putting him off. And but he did fill out the survey, and there was a comment there that needed some follow up. And so he called again, uh, spoke to the secretary, and said, "Look, I'd like a meeting with." Uh, uh, this gentleman, please, uh, could you tell him that I want to discuss the feedback that he gave us in the survey? And he got an appointment for the following day. So, so it, it could really be used also to uh, to open doors where they might have been shut before. Yeah, absolutely. And what you mentioned is really amazing, the fact that it's not even so much about the solution, but also about the effort and the care. Absolutely. Yeah, um, absolutely. Probably otherwise we provide a quite similar solution, but they really, you change the perception of the customer and uh, yeah. you build up actual partnership. Yeah. With them. Uh, 
Uh, and, and you know, we could, it wasn't always possible to give the customer what they wanted. But yeah. if you if you went back to them and said, "Look, you know, we saw what you wrote, right? Unfortunately, we can't do this because of this, this, and this." At least, if, you know, if you take the trouble to explain to them, you know, why it, it's not possible to give them what they want, then you know, we found that they, you know, customers were were very understanding. You know. Uh, there's one other thing obviously the the, the follow-up it does create expectations right so it's so it's very important once you have started this dialogue um, w- with the customer that you, that it continues right I mean we had a couple of cases where there'd been issues and, and someone went to follow up and then um, you know radio silence nothing else was done um, actually was being done but nobody was communicating with the customer and then the customer got rather angry and said look you came to see me you know we talked about it and now not you're do- not doing anything about it in actual fact we were but we weren't communicating saying you know we are doing something but it's taking longer than expected so so it's really important to to maintain this open communication with the customer and i think most people will will find out that once they start doing this it resolves a lot of issues because a lot of the issues that that come to light between a customer and supplier are very often down to bad communication. Absolutely, that's uh, very often the case. And um, here, when it comes to measuring really of these uh, converted customers from uh, detractors to promoters, have you measured uh, over what's the business impact of uh, these sections? So, for example, how their customer lifetime value changes, or if they subsequently were are more willing to refer you to another company? Actually, no, we didn't. We 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 never we never looked at our our program as uh, at the financial correlation. It was for for us. It was always a continuous improvement process. So what we were looking at, we, we figured that the, the finances would follow, but the important thing was to respond to customers, to improve our processes, in, improve the perception that our customers had of us, and that then the financial results will, would follow. A lot of the businesses that we were in are, um, are very cyclical. You know, if you, if you think about, for instance, oil and gas, or if you think about mining, there were a couple of years uh, during which uh, some of the mining companies weren't spending any money at all. So, you know, trying to tie it back to revenue growth as the, the NPS uh, literature does right at the very beginning w- was very difficult, right? We were looking probably more at uh, share of wallet and things like that. And, and, and that data is not always that easy to come by. But we never, we never tied the NPS results to the financials. We were always looking at the, the year-on-year improvement on the improved relationships with uh, with our customers and we separated our customers into into various different segments uh, so we'd always look at segment by segment you know how we were doing and uh, this was really the important thing it was really very much a, a quality improvement process rather than a, yeah. than a financial improvement process yeah this makes a lot of sense what would you say though the managers who really discontinued their cx programs because they can't get a single roi number I think that's that's a real pity because I think you know the I don't necessarily think you have to tie it back to to a CX program, right? I think you look at the perception of customers overall. You look at customer satisfaction. Let's face it; nowadays there are so many different companies in in markets doing the same thing. Where are you going to differentiate? Uh, and that has to be customer service, and, and and the approach to customers has to be one of the big differentiation factors out of the market uh, and if you're not going to approach CX in a, in, in a consistent way then it, it's not going to work right I, I was looking at uh, a presentation some time ago by Ron Kaufman who is a, a big name in, in in service excellence and he rightly points out that customers expectations are evolving the whole time you know what what is what is um, exceptional today becomes the norm tomorrow and you so you have to keep moving forwards with the way that you handle customers and what you offer customers and if you're not approaching your cx in a proactive and in a consistent way 
then you're going to be going backwards and eventually you're opening the uh, the door to uh, challenges by competitors and new entrants into the market uh, as they'll pick up on th this lack of um, giving customers what they want and there are a sufficient amount of companies out there who are ready to offer cus customers what they want so so i think not giving cx any priority is 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 not a sustainable it's it's not a sustainable strategy uh, over the medium to long term. Totally agree, but uh, yeah, just because all the entire industry is crazy about now proving the ROI and how to do it, and we sometimes forget that the most important thing is really to you should tick the box, you should provide uh, the best service in order to survive and to grow, and it's not even no. about doing the numbers. Look, I, I think I think it's it's a it's a problem probably particularly for small and medium-sized mm -hmm. uh, companies right yeah because you know big, big companies they they're swept up more easily in the trends the buzzwords and the technology uh, budgets and resources are generally not an issue right but in in the in smes there's a far greater focus on required resources and return they can't afford to do something just because everybody else is doing uh, doing it they need to see the end result right and in um, in smes there's also a lot of double hatting uh, you know, people with several roles. Uh, the latest I saw just yesterday, I think, was somebody who was head of HR and head of customer experience at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it's an interesting combination, right? Yeah. But SMEs also have one one a very very large advantage, and that's their size, right? Think of them as speedboats in comparison with the you know large companies, uh, super tankers, right? A speedboat can turn on a sixpence whereas a super tanker needs miles. So SMEs can get things done faster. With purpose and, and focus, culture change is much easier to achieve, uh, given the right agreements. And process changes and new tool, tools can be introduced much quicker than in large corporations. And a lot of things can be achieved without spending too much money, right? But there has to be focus and there has to be the will to, to, to make change. And so from that perspective, and I would say that's probably one of my areas of expertise is, is particularly with SMEs, they need to make use of the versatility and flexibility that they have. And there, there are quick wins that can be achieved by SMEs for not a lot of money. Absolutely. And um, having said that, how do you see the maturity in terms of customer experience of like the bigger companies versus the SMEs? Yeah, I, I, as I say, I think you know the, the bigger companies they have more resources to to throw at uh, mm -hmm. throw at this kind of thing, and you know they're probably involved in you know more conferences and and and, and things like that where think tanks where all of this gets discussed, right? Very often SMEs are focusing more on survival on a day to day basis. So I would say that, with some exceptions, you know large corporations probably have a higher degree of maturity. On the other hand, I think that in, in many in some large corporations, it's as I said before, it's done because everybody else is doing it, not necessarily with a very large degree of conviction. Whereas the SMEs that are doing it, that are focusing on CX, they're doing it because they they believe that it's the right thing to do, and there's probably more conviction and far more, let's say, ingrained culture in the efforts than than maybe in large corporations. Okay, great. When, you know, when it comes to the emotional connection in the customer experience journey, sometimes we're hearing that uh, it's all about business in B2B, but of course there are more and more people claiming that it's the same as B2C. What's your position on this one? I certainly think that the emotional connection, okay, the emotional connection in B2B it is not as strong as in B2C. Mm -hmm. that, that's clear. I, th I think you know, the, the emotional connection in B2C is, is very important. You know, you make snap decisions and, and you know, you, you see your friend has a new cell phone. You say, okay, I need one too. Uh, it's not always rational. It's not always, a, yeah. let's say, an absolute need. Whereas in, in, in B2B, obviously, you know, the, the, the whole pre-purchase process is a, lot, uh, is a lot more complex. There are more people involved. But that's not to say that emotions are not, don't play a part. I think it's important for any company to, to, to know their customers. So who, who am I dealing with? Who are the users? And, I, and I'm talking about, let's say, if you're selling machinery, who are the users? Who are the people on the shop floor? What are their wants and needs, 
right? Who are the influencers? Who are the people within the company who are going to have input into this decision? And what are their needs and, and requirements? And some of those will also be on an emotional plane. And so it's important to try and ascertain what those are, you know, when, when you're trying to establish a, a relationship with a customer. Now, of course, you know, the um, focus on compliance over the past uh, few years has, has made it a little bit more difficult. You know, it's changed the rules of the games, you know, with regards to what's acceptable and what, what isn't. You know, there was, there was a time where you could, uh, you know, take a customer away for a weekend to go and play golf. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, this, is, this is not not considered acceptable anymore but there are a lot of other things that you can still do which are you know within the uh, within the guidelines of, of of what's acceptable and what's appropriate to show customers that you still care and to try and you know establish this human relationship on different levels within the company and, and i've seen it done and it it does go a long way because if you have this personal connection that then people will talk to you. They'll say, look, you know, uh, look, Michael, we, we really like your product, but, you know, there, there are one or two issues here which we're having trouble with. You know, do you, is there any way that you can, you know, try and find a solution to this? So, so if you have this more informal connection where, where somebody's going to be uh, happy to pick up a telephone and call you and talk to you on a one-to-one -one basis, then I think this, this is also something which, which is important and we shouldn't forget that. The human factor is, is still alive and well in, in B2B. It's not just technology and uh, purchasing evaluation committees. Yeah, I, at the end of the day, again, you're dealing with people, so their decisions seem to be more rational than in, in the B2C, but they will do business with someone they like. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Um, we end up all of our conversations uh, with the same question, and it, it's if you can provide only one single advice to B2B companies, what it would be? Okay, I would say if you make sure that you know your customers, and I mean really know them, then everything else can fall into place fairly easily. Don't make assumptions, work on your personas and your customer journey maps, and these will show you the priorities that you have that you should have in place to improve your business. So my advice would be make sure that you really, really know your customers. And um, it's an ongoing process that you should be revisiting every now and then, eh? Absolutely. I mean, you know, as I said before, the uh, customer's requirements, you know, they change consistently. Mm -hmm. So it's something that has to be reviewed at, at regular intervals, say, are my customers still, still the same? Are the requirements still the same? You know, as technology improves or the marketplace changes, re their requirements will change too. New entrants on the market, you know, what, what, what are they doing? How's this changing? So yes, it, it's a constant, it's an ongoing process. Absolutely. Okay. Oh, great. Uh Thanks a lot, Michael, for your time. It was a super interesting conversation. Hope Thank that you, we'll have the chance to chat also in the future. Why not in a few months? And it will be great to share also how is your uh, new adventure going and also this perspective for our listeners. Love to. Thanks a lot. If you liked this episode, hit follow and visit gemseek.com to learn more. Let's make an impact on the world of CX together. Thank you for listening.